And welcome everybody. Everybody, we are out on uh, we're out on Twitter, everybody. Twitter Spaces, taking your calls. I'm also going to be on the restream in just a second, and of course over on Rumble. If you raise your hand on the Twitter Spaces app, or uh, at least they access Twitter Spaces, and you raise your hand, I will be bringing you up to ask your question. And uh, by doing so, by raising your hand, you're consenting to go out on multiple platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, uh, YouTube, Rumble, wherever we have, find ourselves. We push ourselves out there in all these different. With the cool guys on Rumble? With the cool guys on Rumble and uh, Twitch. But uh, today, today I've invited a friend and colleague and somebody who's helped me out, Dr. David Nazarian. People are always asking about concierge medicine. Well, Dr. Nazarian is doing that work. And so I thought I'd get him in here to talk about what that is like and what that means and what the difference is between standard uh, general medical care. Also, he specializes in IV therapies and anti-aging interventions, and people are asking me about that as well many times. And I have a fleetingly sort of peripheral knowledge of all these things. So I thought I'd get somebody here who has some experience. So uh, all that said, let's get to it. Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And thank you. We are back with our Thursday show. As we had uh, mentioned yesterday, we'll be back again on Tuesday a little bit later and uh, Wednesday and Thursday at 3 o'clock. The only guest I'm certain about next week is Dr. Gleb Sabursky, who is a cognitive psychologist, a very smart guy with a very kind of specific uh, point of view, but uh, always adds something very interesting. That's a really smart name. Sabursky. T.S. I think he's Ukrainian. Gleb. Gleb, Gleb Sabursky. Very smart guy, and he um, he uh, sort of um, brought my attention to this notion of fundamental cognitive biases, and there's some very fundamental biases. I was reading his book and some of his blogs, and it turns out uh, one of the things that gets to me is I have a positive bias. Some people have a negative bias, and I began thinking that these positive and negative biases were really fundamental to how people were reacting to COVID, for instance, uh, and the negative biases are still people out there that are risk aversive. And as he pointed out, he goes, look, we need both the positive and the negative biasy in the in the human genome. It's, it may have a genetic sort of basis to it, or maybe environmental, as most things with human behavior, but that we need the people with the positive bias who feel confident and gonna go out and kill the mammoth, and we need the people with the negative bias who are gonna stay in the cave and keep it warm and look after the kids who are fearful, uh, more fear-based. Again, it's, it's a balance between positive and negative. So we'll talk about the very, the fundamental cognitive biases. And of course, these days, cognitive dissonance is alive and well. Susan, what's your bias? Positive. You're a positive bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, positive bias. Don't you think? Oh, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, I think I'm more positive than you are. Probably. I, I think you don't... Because you've seen more bad things than you me. You don't have anxiety the way I do. And so yeah. anxiety... <clears throat> sort of temper is my And I'm also advice. a woman, so I'm tougher. So it's not as bad as it is for I have, you. I will like you whine more than I do. Jesus, you've been talking a lot about that. The last couple of days, <laughs> yeah. So I can't, you heard her talk about that. Well, listen, that. all women know that. Okay. We give birth and then we go through the worst pain in our lives and then we give birth again. Yeah. Like this, this, men would never do that. Never. No, never. There, well, one man would do it and that would be the end of the species. Women are tough. I, I had a recent We're, experience. I, again, I, you know I'm not able to really talk about this yet, but man, was that driven home for me. So I, I have had a vivid experience of this lately, and uh, you all will get to share that with me when, when things come around. I can really talk about it. But, but that is a vivid reality for me right now. Men are stronger. So stop talking about women being stronger. They're not stronger. They're tougher. In spite, and they're a lot tougher in spite of not being as strong. And you have to be extra tough then. So I'm saying the toughness is a phenomenal feature of, of being a human female. So, Susan, yeah, I agree with you. it's true. I mean, I agree with you. we were built for it. Yep. We give birth. <laughs> yeah. give yep. birth to triplets. Like, 
Who knew? Uh, yeah, would have, that would have done me in. So uh, let's get to our guest today. It is Dr. David Nazarian. Uh, Dr. Nazarian founded My Concierge MD. Uh, he has been working in the entertainment industry and working around concierge medicine for a while. He's also developed uh, some strategies for anti-aging and IV therapies. People are people are accessing a lot of different sorts of therapeutics these days that are not sort of in the mainstream medical lexicon and are not specifically treating disease. It's more in the sort of prevention and quality of life zone. I know fleetingly little about all this. I, I sort of read it when it comes around, but I really have no real experience with it. But Dr. Nazarian uh, has had experience, so let's bring him in here, Dr. Dave Nazarian. Thank you. Dr. Drew, thank you for having me. And you have you know a lot about a lot of things. I would I wouldn't well I but but I don't but I don't have the same experience that you have. I, uh, and again, you can find Dr. Nazarian at myconciergemd.com. Uh, I myself have used their services, full disclosure, and he has helped me with some screening procedures, and he's got a lot of... Uh, I want to I want to go to that. I want to get some of those uh, youthful... Okay, so let's go right Infusions. There. Let's go right there, since that's where Susan's energy is. That's um, where it is, all the she, time. Susan got a stem cell infusion down in Central America, and she has never... never um, I don't want to say never been recovered. happier. Yeah, never been happier, and she wants to do it again. Are you doing PRP or stem cell, and what what's the state of the art with all that? So you know, I've had a lot of patients actually go outside the country for stem cells. Uh, it's interesting. It's also a little bit maybe sad. You know, we're not allowed to um, manipulate stem cells here in the U.S., but outside the country, mm -hmm. they're manipulating them in different ways. Some of the stuff that they're doing is questionable, but I've had a lot of people that really have had really good results with it. Um, I'm not, step, go ahead, Dr. Ju. Nope, well, I was gonna say, I, I, I've heard of, uh, was it lysozymes or lysosomes that they're using? Is that what you mean by manipulation? Or do you mean actually changing the structure of the stem cells? So I don't know exactly what they're doing, but there's, there's different centers and if you, read a lot of the athletes, NBA players, they go to Germany, they go to Latin America, they go outside the country. They take the stem cells, I think they add different components to it, and then they mm. either re-inject it or they do IV infusion therapy. I mean, I do believe stem cells is the future. Um, the question is, you know, telling the stem cells what is needed to be done. If you just take stem cells mm -hmm. and in, infuse it, I don't think it, it, it's, it's effective. But if you could actually tell it what to do, um, it, it's effective. And also if you inject it specifically into joints, tendons, you know, stem cells, PRP, they have cytokines, they have growth factors. So it's your own body's way of healing itself. So it does have healing properties. Right. Yeah, these anti-inflammatory effects. I, I've spoken to friends that are professional athletes that have gotten, they've gotten PRP and stem cells, and they they have had to go outside the country to get the stem cells to, that that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not knowledgeable enough to know what that means, but and the, it's from it's from the uh, the uh, placenta. Oh, it's the fetus, the placenta. Well, it might be the I don't know if it's cord or placenta. I, they, I don't know. Yeah, it's like the cord, I but, guess. But and here's they, the thing, Dr. Nazarian. They they gave Susan a big infusion of these these stem cells, yeah. and they have anti-inflammatory properties, uh, and she had a, a marked reduction in her generalized joint complaints. However, they also gave her four milligrams of IV Decadron. And so I, yeah. I don't know which was the, I don't know which was the, yeah. the successful it treatment. Like we can't hear you, we can't hear you, your mic's off. Oh, I'm off. Yeah. Um, it lasted like four months. It lasted was, longer than steroids And I had, have. I had some certain pains in my back that went away, and then I also had it in my arms, and I was just like, I was in heaven for like four months, and um, yeah, and I've and I've talked to a lot of other people who have done it. What was the what? What was the reason they gave you the steroid with stem cells? Usually, they they, they don't were administer. concerned. Uh, so, yeah, some but so, I guess there have been some anaphylactoid type reactions to the stem cells, and this is part of their routine protocol. To they didn't hold back. Yeah, they gave a large dose of decadron. I was sort of surprised. I know, and, but but. I think yeah. that it actually worked because I felt like I was more limber after that. Like when I worked out, I got my back, I could stretch my back more after 
a while and I just didn't have that same numb pain in my arm that I was having all the time. And then I also lost, a, you know, something in my lower back that was kind of bugging me. Well, but I also felt physically like more limber, I yeah, guess you would say. But again, that could, I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of all that. I, I felt let's, it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was a placebo. But oh, it was I, definitely not placebo. It was definitely not, I don't think it was placebo, but I, I just don't know how to parse it out from the Decatron. That's I mean, we got to go back down there and find out if it works again next <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, I suppose. Although it was rather pricey and they gave it to me for free. I was very fortunate. They wanted to give it to Drew and I said, well, he, he had to pass because he doesn't do that. Also, I get, uh, and I, I get weird reactions to everything. I benefited from that. That experience, one hundred percent. So let's talk about other anti-aging sorts of intervention. Human growth hormone. Where does that stand these days? Yeah. So there's a lot of physicians that are prescribing it. I don't prescribe it. The FDA, you know, really came down hard in regards to prescribing human growth hormone. They wanted you to have an insulin challenge test to actually mm -hmm. see if you're growth hormone deficient or not. There's some physicians that I'll check IGF levels to get an idea of what the levels may be. But, you know, so I do hormone replacement. I do testosterone replacement for patients. Testosterone has been around for a long time. We know its safety profile. We know its risk profile. Growth hormone, on the other hand, it, it, it has not. So, you know, there's some concern in regards to its use long term, if it can cause some blood disorders. So, and, and, and there are some side effects that come with it as well, maybe joint swelling, carpal tunnel. So yeah, there, there are physicians that do prescribe it. I don't, again, just because of the safety profile. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that, but I know a lot of people are going after at least for short periods of time. And I actually worry about things like, uh, you know, cranial nerve entrapment. I mean, you can't control what, you know, what bony growths can happen, what, uh, you know, kind of thick, thickening of soft tissue or bone can develop. Yeah, absolutely. Testosterone and estrogen, you have another fan on the other side of the mic here, and, and Susan Pinsky for that. This is do, all about me you, today. This is about you today. Do you, do you, right. how do you do that replacement? Susan, tell your story real quick so Dr. Zarian knows what you're coming so from. So I am on uh, bioidentical hormone treatments pellets. For, the, pellets for the last 10 years, a little more. And um, I had early menopause and I was miserable until I was about 45, 50. And, started it and my life was changed because you know i thought i had depression and anxiety and it was come to being i had menopause and um since then i've been an avid fan of that um i've been doing it for a really long time though and um i have to like i like it when my levels are really even for a long period of time but every once in a while they'll kind of fluctuate and i can really tell if my i'm a little out of balance mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so um but it is interesting to see that when your when your hormones are not balanced and you're not you're going up and down up and down that it can really change the way you feel now it now i get problems in my joints um and a little bit so i like oh, oh i think my hormones are off and i treat them and then i feel better so i'm a big fan yeah and so her so we, we've done a couple streams on this before so the the important message is the women's health initiative was a flawed study it did not fit it flew in the face of everyone's clinical experience for sure hormones need to be approached very cautiously and, and the risk profile assessed for every given individual testosterone has been left off the menu for way too long your your ovaries when they shut down cease producing per testosterone as well as estrogen and progesterone and to leave the testosterone out is frankly weird sexist but short-sighted i don't know why we did that but uh, testosterone is very important for women as well talk to us dr nazarian a little bit about the replacement therapies you do for both men and women yeah yeah absolutely so dr joy as you mentioned so before they used to prescribe hormones to all women who were undergoing menopause the women's health health initiative there was a small increase in breast cancer but if you look at the good metabolite of estrogen estradiol and all the benefits it has, you know, I do believe in hormone replacement. Uh, and, you know, we prescribe, um, it's a mixture of estrogen, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone for females. Uh, I'm not a big fan of pellets. With pellets, the sometimes the absorption uh, rate varies. So, and if you look at the literature, um, if hormones are taken orally, so I like to use 
trosh, which salt, which dissolves under the tongue. But there's a lot of oral benefits that creams and pellets in regards to cardioprotective have. Um, and in men, so in your 20s, your testosterone level is the highest. In your 30s, there's a decrease. 40s, there's a decrease, so on and so on. And testosterone in men plays lots of different roles. Increased muscle mass, decreased fat, uh, stamina, sexual drive, cognitive function, uh, bone density, so on and so on. So what we do is we optimize testosterone levels in men to what's the higher level of normal. We're not doing anabolic steroids. We're not increasing levels to beyond what it would be for their age. And a lot of, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 of men really enjoy all the benefits and, and see great results with it. And when you say the upper limits of, you know, the norm, normal range for testosterone is so crazy. It's 200 to 800. Uh, do you aim for like six to 800? Is that sort of where you're aiming? So yeah, so we're aiming for seven to 800, high range of normal. So okay. if it's done, yeah. if it's done, pro if it's done properly, testosterone won't convert into estrogen. But if your testosterone levels are too high, it'll convert. And there's some physicians that will prescribe estrogen blockers, but you really don't need you really don't need it if it's done properly and and it's kept at the higher of normal you know everything works out great yeah it's it's a lot of the testosterone uh conversion to estrogen happens in adipose tissue and if you're taking so much testosterone that you're converting to estrogen you are on too much testosterone i mean i think that's right. a pretty good right. sign that there's too much going on here um, so there's the hormone replacement. How about things like, uh, nicotinamide, NAD and nicotinamide riboside? You and I have talked about that. That's a fascinating area for me. What do you make of all that? Yeah, it really is. You know, it's newer. Um, so NAD, you know, our body produces it. Uh, if you go back into biology class, chemistry, you know, there's this whole pathway NAD is used to create ATP, the mitochondria, your whole body uses it. So with um, stress, oxidative stress, other factors, lifestyle, um, NAD can decrease. So um, it, it's a really fascinating one, this NAD. It, the bioavailability or absorption with tablets or pills is very low, but it's very high with IV. And we use it for different reasons. We use it for anti-aging or energy, focus. Um, we also use it for patients that are undergoing withdrawal or detoxing from substances or meds. Um, it's interesting. And it also has this brain restorative therapy uh, function, if you will. It seems to increase serotonin, dopamine levels. I've had patients mm -hmm. that are on antidepressant, SSRIs, and they feel so good, they want to stop it. And I tell them, you know, you don't want to mm. stop that. You want to wean off that. But yeah, it's, it's pretty, really interesting. Yeah. That, hmm. That's what happened to Susan, right? With the NAD? Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, with the testosterone. I'm going to try the NAD now. Well, the NAD is, is quite interesting. Uh, uh, how many infusions before you get a response and how, how do you judge that? You know, it, I actually found out about NAD through couple of patients that were just raving about it and using it. So I did the research and looked up some of the benefits it could have. I've actually done it multiple times. Uh, you know, I, when I do it, I feel energy. Um, I feel focus, um, it has some relaxing properties too. NAD can have some flushing symptoms if it's given too fast. So it's usually run in an IV over a period of two, four hours, even six hours, depending on the dosage that you do. But, you know, personally, from my own experience, the interesting part is the focus. You actually see a, a change in focus. Wow, interesting. I, I, I've heard of people also complaining of sort of abdominal cramps or something. Is that is that part of the infusion side effect? Yeah, so if it's run too fast, because you can get this flushing symptoms, you can get chest pain, feeling of shortness of breath, abdominal pain. If it's run slow, you won't have any of these symptoms. It's only if it's run really fast 
um, it can actually drop your blood pressure. So it really needs to be done by someone who knows what they're doing. It was interesting to me that uh, when Joe Rogan uh, came out with his treatment for COVID, when he, his own personal physician did for him, people got all excited about the ivermectin. But the really interesting treatment he got that was way outside of normal was he got two, or he said three NAD infusions, or two, you know, one every day. And I thought, boy, that's an interesting intervention. And that is people, of course, nobody makes any issue of that. They, they, they want the horse dewormer, you know, you know, want him strung up for that. But an NAD infusion every day, I thought was a very clever intervention. And I actually talked to Joe about it and he said it really helped him. Isn't that interesting? It is, yeah, it is. You know, I haven't used it really for COVID, but we do lots of different IV therapies. We have Myers, Myers Plus, vitamin C. There's actually ongoing clinical trials, a lot of data in regards to vitamin C IVs. And vitamin C has antiviral properties. Um, you know, it may be a combination of just flushing the system, vitamin C, but we've done these IVs for patients that have had COVID and they've felt a lot better. What is the Myers, Myers infusion? So Myers, there was a Dr. Myers, uh, I think it was in the 1970s, he came up with this uh, formula, if you will. So it has uh, the B-complex vitamins, B12, vitamin C, um, magnesium, and calcium, I believe, is in that mm -hmm. specific one. You know, and mm -hmm. we, we, have, we have edited and we have added some other amino acids and other vitamins just to make it a little bit more of a comprehensive ID. All right, let's talk a minute for a minute. <laughs> well, I've got some callers here. Let me see if they have any questions about the IV, but I want to talk a little bit more about concierge medicine. Uh, so let me see if uh, Michael wants to ask a question about the IV therapies per se. Uh, Michael, you're, you're muted. You got to click the mic. There you go. What's up, Michael? Hi, doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my son is 30. He's a cancer survivor at rhabdomyosarcoma. Mm. He's looking at doing the some of these treatments like uh, testosterone. He feels fatigued, like he's not uh, focused, um, and he's been doing some reading. I'm really concerned uh, about that, especially of having had cancer before. What is there any issues, Michael? I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You're gonna give us a little more. A little more information. How old is he now? He's 30 years old. How long ago was the diagnosis made? Uh, two years ago. And where was the rhabdomyosarcoma? It was in his right leg, I believe, upper thigh. And, and how, was he, how was he treated? Uh, he had surgery mm -hmm. and chemotherapy. Do you, know, for six do you know what chemo he got? No, I know it's very rare in adults. Mm -hmm. um, the rhabdomyosarcoma, mm -hmm. I guess it's under seven. Yeah. Um, he was treated at Walter Reed and okay. Uh, okay. Johns Hopkins. Okay, uh, so state of the art ca cancer chemo yes. therapeutics. And did you say radiation also? He did not yeah. have to do radiation. No radiation, and that complete and that was concluded eighteen months ago. Um, he completed a. About no, about eight months ago. He eight was, months ago. Yeah, and and so it's fatigue. And is there anything else going on with him that can explain the fatigue? Is he anemic? Does he have any other laboratory and, abnormalities, or is he having to take any medications that could be making him fatigue? Anything of that sort? No, he looks very healthy. Okay. surprisingly healthy. Okay, big guy. He's in the military still, but okay. I still I feel like him take wanting to take these things are not safe or it's going to accelerate I, his i understand and michael by those things you really mean testosterone right yes okay. he's looking at that okay go ahead uh, dr nazarian yeah so testosterone can feed into things so anytime somebody has any kind of history of cancer or they have cancer you, testosterone is not a therapy that you want to start because it can feed into things. It can make things grow. Well, I'm gonna what, let, me, let me interrupt you. What what if his testosterone levels are low normal? What if it's like 400 or 500, and he just wants to try bringing it up to 700 to see if he feels better? Is that likely to be a problem? So, okay, it's a great question, Doctor Drew. So, so he's young. Uh, first, you want to make sure that his cancer is completely in remission and it's and it's uh, not not active in any way. 
in young yeah. patients, patients under 40, I actually, what I, I, what I use, and a lot of times it's successful, is we use HCG injections, human chorionic gonadotropin injections. Basically, HCG stimulates the pituitary gland to produce FSH, LH, which goes to the testes and tells the testes to produce testosterone. Sometimes in younger males that their testosterone level is low, they just need something to kickstart it. And HCG so, does the trick. So it's, sort of, it's sort of kickstarting his own testes. How about Clomid? I remember we used to use that in people with uh, sluggish testes. Is that, does that show any benefit? Yeah, Clomid is, is, is also used, but HCG I found to have better results. So, so Michael, we're, we're, we don't know your son. We're not practicing medicine. We're talking in generalities. Uh, you know, I have prostate cancer. I, I would love to take testosterone, but I'm scared to do it. I, I, I think it would be a bad idea for the testosterone, for the uh, prostate cancer. And I, and I think your concern is legitimate. Uh, so whatever he decides, it's not going to be a zero risk proposition, but sometimes you have to kind of do something to get people you know, quality of life back. You have to take some risk. So uh, I, I maybe, you know, he can talk to his oncologist and whatnot about HCG, about testosterone. Susan, you're What about up. when you're in your, like, late 70s or something? If and somebody has a cancer yeah, and you're in your late 70s. Yeah, and you're like, 70s, yeah, I think I'd feel better. And you have, you know, you're... It's, that, a, different, it's a different question. Then mm -hmm. you might be interested in it just to feel mm -hmm. better and have more longevity or... It's, it's funny, you know, it, 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 that... You wouldn't get longevity out of it necessarily, but you'd bet you'd feel you'd, better. You'd get a better quality of life, but but it's the interesting question always that that is like, hey, we could shut. Let's say giving the testosterone could cut his life short by a couple of years. This this seventy nine year old you're talking about, and uh, he would say to me, I've been in this situation with patients many times. He would go, I just need to be feel better. I can't keep living like this. I don't care if I, I you know, um, you know, cut off five extra years. Fast forward to eighty five, he's not so happy. He's not because really? it's, like, it's like asking who wants to live to 94 years of age. Ask a 93 year old. Wait, so Th that's so that's what the, if he had a really good time between 75 and 85? I, it's up to it's a very, <laughs> very personal decision. I'm just telling you, I've been in that situation many times. And what I usually tell them is like, you know, a lot of people don't want to live to 94, but and, and I don't want to either. But ask a 93 year old who wants to live to well, 94. Well, I was thinking more like you'd enjoy your life for like five more years since you're going to no, probably I, we die anyway. We understand what you're saying. We understand what you're saying. But but it's it's a hard decision. Or even if you were like 70. Susan, we get your question. We get How it. How about it's if you were thing. 70? These are hard. These then you'd to live be, to 80. And these have to be, and back to Michael, these have decisions have to be made with the doctor, with the patient, with the patient's family. And uh, I'm with the I, wife. Is that what you're yeah, talking about? Yeah, and, and the dad. And so Michael's involved with this. And I say, good for you. I wonder if the wife's younger. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I want to let poor Michael off the hook here. So, 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 Michael, it's a great question. I think your head's in the right place with it, but, but there may be a way to help him. Does that make sense? It does. He's yeah. around 400. I am going to give him that advice and yeah. talk about HCG with him also. Yeah, great. Let's see how it goes. Thank you so much. Thank, Ooh, thank you, Doctor. Very, very good question. Um, let's do this. Let's um, maybe take a little break. Again, we're taking calls off the Twitter spaces. If you guys want to raise your hand, I'll bring you up just as we did with Michael. And again, if you do come up to ask a question, you'll be streaming out on multiple platforms, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, Rumble. Uh, let me quickly look at the restream and the Rumble. Huh. Um, JHP, JHEP767, he says, you don't like your fans on Rumble. Uh, thank you, Susan. For no, no, it's because I, I said he, I had, there were cool guys on Rumble. Oh, there are cool guys he everywhere. Knows, he knows what I mean. Okay. No, I didn't mean it like that. I was just joking okay. around because right. they have a lot of fun over there. But he's alone today, or I, I'm a, assuming it's a he. But um, we love you too. Okay, and I'm looking out on the restream to see. Uh, let's see if anybody. They're coming in. sucks. Jay says. They just put us on the uh, home if you're going to go oral, go endo enclomaphene. Enclomaphene is a different than clomid. I don't know what that is. It is uh, J JT is saying go for enclomaphene? Is that a different preparation of clomid? I believe it is. I, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. It's not. I'm not either. Use. And again, and, yeah. and being uh, JT, we're really not using clomid for this anymore. This is back in the day when HCG was really not available commercially very much. 
And I used to treat guys who had steroid-induced testosterone deficiency. So these guys that stay on large doses of steroids for long periods of time, their testes shut off and they don't come back on. Now people do all these fancy cyclings and things and it's, you know, they go on and off and they take HCG when they're off. There's a lot of fancy stuff going on that was not available back in the day. And we used to use Clomid to kind of try to get things going again. So again, mm -hmm. what I want to do is take a little break here. Speaking of anti-aging, we're going to talk about our friends over at GenuCell. And when we get back, uh, Dr. Nazarian, I want to talk a little bit about, just do a little primer on concierge medicine, what it means, the ethics, who should get it, what the advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, and we'll be back just after this. Don't know where to start on your skincare journey either. We all have that something we'd like to take care of. For me, it's the under eye bags and puffiness when I don't get enough sleep and the dryness here. Thankfully, I discovered GenuCell. I started with their serum for under eye puffiness and then found their GenuCell XV moisturizer, which dramatically changed my face's texture. After only a few uses, for Susan, she hates the annoying area under her nose during allergy season. She tried everything, but no matter what, her skin is dry and flaky and nothing seemed to help. Until she found GenuCell's Silky Smooth XV Moisturizer, soaked right in, she was hooked after one use, and now loves all of their other products. GenuCell uses a proprietary base formulated by a pharmacist and clinical levels of botanical extracts for the best skin care money can buy. GenuCell products are cruelty-free, natural, and made in the USA. I cannot think of a better set of products to take care of my skin. Plus, they guarantee happiness with all their products. See results you love guaranteed or your money back. Try GenuCell's most popular package today and use code DREW for 10% off your entire order. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com and code DREW for 10% off. I'm back and uh, I was noticing on Rumble, Susan, you're being called badass and I would agree with that. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure what Jay I've got a is. really high testosterone I know level. J Hep is getting on to here, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, but he seems to know you. Uh, so let's bring Dr. Nazarian up. Oh, Rex is uh, on the loose here. Let's bring Dr. Nazarian back and uh, talk about uh, concierge care. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of concierge care. I understand uh, it, what's complicated. So talk, talk about what, how, you, how you decided to get in concierge care and what some of the ethical considerations are in doing so. Yeah, I mean, as you know, medicine has changed. Unfortunately, it's changed for the worse. Uh, I believe everybody should have access to great medicine. Uh, unfortunately, with insurance reimbursement, it's become it, as such that a lot of physicians are forced to see uh, a volume and spend less time with patients. Uh, I, I just didn't really like the idea of just seeing a lot of patients, not knowing them, not getting to actually know, you know, all the details of their history and also being able to spend time with screening, uh, preventative testing, early diagnosis. Uh, so, you know, from, from there it, it grew and, and, and we also do, do the executive health physicals. So patients that are part of the concierge practice, they come in once a year, we do A through Z workup for them, uh, heart screening, cancer screening, uh, uh, screening ultrasounds, and, and so on. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting dilemma. I, I don't think people understand that, you know, I, I see a lot of Medicare patients. I like taking care of sick patients. And if you're going to take care of sick patients, you're taking care of old patients. And old patients are all Medicare. Uh, and... and and so I've just sort of always done that. And, and I, I have patients I've followed for many, many, two decades or three decades. And so I'm I just am doing that now. Um, but, but, I, but, the, but, but I make no effort to m make money, to make, make ends meet even practicing medicine. And people don't understand that Medicare restricts you to about $42 a visit and maximum visits for an hour, sometimes three. And it costs about $100 an hour to run a practice. So you're getting about $20 an hour. Uh, and that's just the way it is. That's just it. Um, and that's just it. And so I, I, you know, and so you end up making your living sort of in the after hours at the hospital and seeing consults and things like that. Or but, running an addiction or, program. Or other things, doing other things. It's just, it's just, it's really hard to 
do medicine properly the way it's structured today. Or you enter in a big system like Kaiser or something like that, and you know those have their own problems with them. People uh, hate that. Leopold will tell you about that. So it's and, really not, and the Kaiser's better than you. Go ahead. It's unfortunate. Yes, please. Yeah. No, it's really unfortunate. I mean, it it really shouldn't be that way. Everyone should have great access to you know care, being able to spend time with their physician. It's it's you know the insurance companies are really to blame. Yeah, they, they run the show and people don't really understand that. And and I, I had my face pressed to the mirror constantly about that issue when I was running an addiction program because it was ridiculous how restrictive the resource, resources were. It was, in, it was insane. And they had they were heartless in terms of how they uh, kicked people out. And they and they ran a they ran a real specific scam back in those days. So it was the patient had to be medically ill. Uh, and they would let them stay in the hospital setting. Again, they were psychiatrically very unstable, neurologically very unstable, but if they weren't medically unstable, they had to be out, out of the hospital, right? So after three or four days, they would say, out. And I would deliver that information to the patient. The patient would say, you got to be, I'm not well, I'm going to, I need more structure. They, they knew they were unsick. I said, I, all I can tell you is the insurance has, after a doctor-to-doctor -doctor review, which is code for the patient has to be discharged, they have a doctor get on the line and tell me I don't know what I'm doing. They've never seen the patient, of course, and the patient needs to be discharged. I, I tell them that I'm, I'm sorry, but if you stay another day, you will be responsible for the cost of the hospitalization, which is a major issue. So here I give them some ideas about aftercare and try to plan something. Patient is destroyed, call their insurance company, the insurance company then tells the patient the following, oh, Mr. Smith, we, of course, if Dr. Pinsky would tell us why you need to stay in the hospital, of course we, you can stay in the hospital. What they don't tell the patient is we have our own, we have our own specified criteria that we have invented that have nothing to do with the clinical situation you're being treated for, but and just have Dr. Pinsky say that you meet those criteria for our criteria, which the patient did not they their criteria were all medical there were no psychiatric criteria and uh and then then the patient would come back and go what why did you tell you you didn't tell the insurance company how sick i am i need to stay okay so now yeah. i file an appeal this this is this i went through this a million times in the 90s and 2000s now i file an appeal the insurance company maybe gives them another day in retrospect. They become the patient is responsible for some of the costs. It's a terrible thing. We try to get rid of it and bring the patient over to an outpatient service or a sober living or something and try to find some way to help these people while the insurances continue to squeeze them. Now, because every time I have a patient in the hospital, I'm making appeals, I am labeled a problematic physician. Uh, now they, they engage in some egregious restriction where a patient it dies. If the patient dies, they go, oh, well, um, uh, we don't practice medicine. There's Dr. Pinsky's discharge order. It's his signature. He discharged the patient. We don't practice medicine. Okay. So I make a complaint. Then I make a complaint to the insurance uh, state insurance commissioner. Now I'm really a, a problematic patient. I get contacted from a problematic provider. Now I get... Um, Okay, Drew. Hang on. This is the important part. Now <laughs> I get contacted by the insurance carrier who says the following, Dr. Pinsky, we're not going to certify you anymore for the care of our patients. In fact, we're going to decertify the whole hospital, decertify the wow. entire hospital. So how do you think wow. that goes down? Now I'm been big shit with the administration and everything else. And so this was a this was a deal. This was their scam. This is how they muscled yeah. their way into mistreating patients. And I went through that for years. What we ended up doing was just really developing elaborate ways to kind of keep patients in residential or outpatient or evening or some sort of care where we could watch them and develop relationship with sober livings. It, it they were always bouncing back in the hospital anyway, but whatever. And of course, that was very expensive for the hospital. And so the hospital decided to get rid of the whole operation. So that that's, you know, they don't, they, it's not worth it for the hospital to try to run quality addiction services, which is why I know whenever there are these four, these programs that are very, very expensive, I know they're not very good. <laughs> it's, it, it is, it, it, it's just, it's not a good business model. Addiction medicine is not a good business. Well, so anyway, uh, providing, okay. uh, what are you doing here now, Susan? What did you send me? 
Oh, you sent me a bunch of stuff. Okay. Not good to text me during the during a Sorry. Adam was actually complaining about this you're going, this you're, morning. I know. You're he going saying, to New York and you're gonna be on the Gutfeld show. I he was sent saying, you the itinerary. He, he was saying Adam was saying this morning that I, I have a stream of consciousness that whatever happens to me in the room, I start talking about. Yeah. It. Yeah, so, stop it. Okay. Just keep moving. Thank you. So so who should, 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 should it would in our in our ideal world, wouldn't we give everybody concierge services? Wouldn't that we try to find a way to get everybody into the concierge system? Look, if, if possible, yes. Again, I think everybody deserves to have good access, but it's just not possible. It's really not. And unfortunately, in every aspect, if you look, you know, uh, people that have more access to funds, they're able to obtain better things. It, it's and, and, and really, the concierge medicine approach, it's just limiting the number of people that you take care of. The, so we take care yeah. of your individuals, families, but we're able to give them more personalized care. Well, I want to thank you as somebody who was the object of that care. You did a great job, and I appreciate it so, so, so very much. Mm. And I, I thought I would give you a chance to talk about what this is as someone who does these services. A and we I, you we saw love our doctor, and he's he took on the whole family, yes, which is really lucky because it's hard when people are, are – when the They're full. Yeah, they're, they're always full. full. They're the full, good, the good but, physicians are always full, and, but, and that's a fact. But we even do it for our kids, even though they're in their they're barely 30s. thirty. Yeah. But lo and um, behold, we became that family. That's a real pain in the ass. But it, but anyway. it just was great during COVID, and also you know whenever they have any kind of problems, like they can call and they're like, God, it's just so nice to have a doctor sit down and talk to me. Yes, they've literally and, expressed that and, and asked that's me how e I am. That's even having a physician in the home. They feel so grateful to to be able to talk to their own doctor and you know and have sort of a personal. You get know, like an hour of psychotherapy. Too. Well, not even Same that, but just the fact that they he. He knows who they are. He, you know, treats them with respect and kindness, and you know, and gives great advice. And that's what that's why we went into this field, Dr. Nazarian. Well, you do that for your patients. I, I, I know, but it, it's but you I only were, see like ten or fifteen a week, right? Yeah. If I were seeing, if I were trying to go full time again, it would be just not possible. You'd have to do concierge. Yeah, I would have to switch over. But it's such a great way to do it, and it's it is expensive, but it's well worth it. Like you think about like how many times women get their nails done. It's more than concierge service, you know. That is true. Or more, they get their you, hair done, or they get the, you know what I mean? It's yes. That that it, my dad, who was an old family practitioner, he used to always complain about the lack of prioritization of people's medical care. He said, you know, he grew up in the twenties, like in the twenties, we had food and doctor, and that and and rent. Th those were the priorities. We made sure that we met our medical needs and had them done in a quality way. And now people sort of think of it as a um, entitlement. And and I I don't. I don't know. I, I think to have care is appropriate, but to have a certain kind of care, I, I, it, it's just not possible to give it to everybody. It's just not possible. We, not without a lot of expense incurred. And you know, if it's a, a centralized system, it's going to be a mess. Centralized medicine is just a mess. It's a mess. And, and, and you know, yeah. And, and you know what else? It's, you know, as physicians, we've become conditioned to treat acute issues. Somebody comes in, yeah. they're having an issue. You treat them, you let you know, you see the next patient, but you know, yep. because of the system, there's not enough time to actually sit down and talk to patients, see how they can change their lifestyle, screening tests to prevent illnesses from happening. So one of the mm -hmm. things that I actually enjoy with what I do is that I can spend the time to try to educate patients, to try to change trajectories, to try to you know, have early prevention diagnosis so that we're not just treating issues, but preventing. And and you have a you have a very uh, welcoming caretaking team there that really is sort of has everyone feels good and has their priorities right and just I, I appreciated the care. So and yet you might see Susan for an IV therapy yet. So uh, and I'm interested in that wow. NAD thing. I, clarity of thought sounds very appealing to me. <laughs> I will be happy. You guys let me know. When and uh, I appreciate the kind words. It's it's a pleasure to to have you, Dr. Drew and Susan. Yeah, I find it fancy, fascinating what we can do nowadays. Yeah, you know, there's a lot to and, and I as like I said, I, I'm trying to open. Maybe Drew should do that. Drew, maybe you yeah, should. I know. I'd like start to a little clinic here in a little South infusion Pass. clinic. Maybe, maybe a satellite for <laughs> well, Dr. Nazarian. Well, that's what my my. Uh, the woman that inserts my pellet said. She said, "Why don't you have Drew like start a little business? We could do like 
you know, get a little van and drive around. And get oh, and a van, a van <laughs> IV thing. Yeah, I worry with that. Well, that, that was my idea. That I mean. we're going to end up rehydrating alcoholics after a binge. <laughs> so that where it concerns oh, me. Well, but we could always maybe tie it in deep with treatment. I don't know. We could figure know. something out. Listen, David, we'll, we'll talk about that. Susan's, uh, she wants the infusions in her backyard is what this is all about. Uh, I like modern medicine. Yeah, I, think, uh, I, I mean, I like, I'm getting old, okay? Everybody knows it, it now. Is. So there, there it is. is. Uh, but, but again, it's, I, I, I'm going to bring in, uh, some other sorts of interesting topics that are not sort of mainstream. I, and let's be clear, you know, I like to be in the school that, you know, gives evidence-based medicine. And, and once we have a standard of care, then those are the things we recommend, but that doesn't mean we can't educate and talk about some of these other phenomenon that may one day, well, cl clearly Dr. Zarian sees being useful and may one day be a standard of care. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and I will no doubt be in touch with you again soon someday. God bless. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to get out to the Twitterverse a bit and uh, deal with some of your stuff. Uh, yes, Steve Boswell, the horrible code response a perfect example of pitiful government directed care. Steve, you are so absolutely correct. I, I, I did not realize how centralized medicine had become and it was a catastrophe. It, it was so centralized in terms of its authority. And so physicians were afraid to do their job of being improvisational and using their judgment. They froze in place. It was disgusting. It was a really an eye-opening experience for me and I, and I will not soon get over it. And I've heard Peter Thiel just talking about the same thing saying that uh, originally computing was highly centralized. Remember big rooms of computers that the military had? And then all of a sudden it became decentralized. We all had our own computer, now it's in our hand. And then the, the social media came in and now it's being centralized again and controlled again. So it's this back and forth between centralization and decentralization, but medicine is something that must be highly decentralized to be, to be yeah, the old mainframe, right, Tom Segar? Um, to be decentralized, to be done properly. So, okay, I'm looking at your guys. Uh, is WOPR the name of the old uh, mainframes? Um, See I was if anybody's some... on uh, Twitter. Uh, We're cooking yeah, on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going uh, out to... Uh, you got to use that platform. Martin. Martin, go ahead. Uh, you should be able to speak once you uh, unmute your microphone. Hey, Dr. Drew. Hi, Martin. What's up? Um, uh, okay, so... Well, <clears throat> I'm hearing you say that, de that decentralization is the best way to go. Right now, we see the healthcare industry going into twinning, right? Our digital twins being put on a mainframe. And this means collecting our data, like big data. Yeah. Um, so what's what's your thought on that? I'd like to hear, because well, I know I, I worked in the healthcare, like uh, the producers of uh, imaging equipment. And I, I know of a company, particularly they call it digital twinning. Well, I, well I, I, I'm on the big data side of research. And so I, I work for, I'm part of an organization called the Prostate Cancer Foundation, and we are funding research really at the very fundamental level. And we get to hear lots of what's going on out there. And big data is a very important topic in cancer research. Uh, in terms of what the insurance carriers and the government do it, I have no idea. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine it's to our advantage. <laughs> Uh, they, they usually don't have that as a priority. It's an epiphenomenon. They're interested in us doing well, so we don't cost them money. Um, but I, I don't have a strong sense of what they're doing. What is your sense? Um, well, it seems dangerous to me. Yeah. I just, it, for me, it feels dangerous. The QR codes, I'm in Canada. Mm. So, um, you know, the, 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 the vaccine passports and all of this, it's, it's about collecting our data. It just seems a little creepy. Uh, it is creepy, I and I and creepy. you know I was yeah. never, <laughs> I was one of these people that said I have nothing to hide. Why are people so worried about this? And then COVID hit, and that reeducated me, <laughs> particularly, <laughs> particularly particularly as, particularly as, it, as it, it went to it these QR, to codes, these for QR codes for vaccine, and then discriminating and then against people, people largely black, black and brown black. in this country, discriminating against them for not getting their vaccine. That was horrific, and that was a simple example of how this goes off the rail. Yeah. And we see it in China. We see what's happening with those mm -hmm. QR codes and, mm -hmm. you know, they can limit your, your, your freedoms. So it's, it's, I mean, it's a good idea for someone, for a hospital to know all of my information, have yeah. it all in one place. I get that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. for them to see the, the war, early warning signs of something, yeah. but yeah. it's still, I mean, I'm on your side on the side of, uh, you know, um, collecting all in one place is, is also dangerous. It's, it was, it, is, it was it such a, a, Martin, I'm going to put you back in the audience here. It, it was such an eye-opening experience for me. I, I really was 
saddened, disgusted, shocked. I, I really had way too much trust for centralized authority. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, here's, uh, boy, the partially examined life is listening to us. I'm going to invite them up there because I was talking about them today. Is that Mark? Uh, is that you? Or is that just somebody that loves the partially examined life? Let me see if you'll manage to come up and talk with us. Uh, Scott, is it verified? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I've asked it him to come up. Let me get. Uh, yeah, well, it is his podcast. It's it's a bunch of other guys too, but it's one I've done a couple of times, and it's just strange. I was talking about it today, and I was. Uh, you're not going to hear this particular podcast for about a month, but I was talking to a psychotherapist that was getting deep into really quality of life issues. Mark, is that you? Hmm. Let's see. Yep, can he, yep. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. How are you? Nice. Good. Yeah, this is Mark. I just saw your broadcasting. Saw well, anything. I appreciate it. Do you want to talk about your uh, music pod? Um, That's old news. I mean, I, I have it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if you knew about the... Uh, this is really okay to just burst in? And yes, yes, please. Because I'm, let, let me just... Full disclosure, I'm a fan of their podcast. I They have taught me a, more philosophy than any philosophy professor ever has. Um, I listened religiously for a while. I haven't listened in a little while. I, I was very kindly asked to come in and talk to these guys, which was a profound honor. And I was talking to a psychotherapist just this morning on a different podcast where she was getting into the nature of happiness and a good life. And I said, you need to educate yourself on philosophy. Listen to the first 100 episodes of the Partially Examined Life. So that was this, just this morning. But what's going on? Uh, yeah, so we're, we've been revving up for our big episode 300. I'm going to try to do a live thing. We haven't actually worked out the details of that, but we're on 296 we just recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been 13 years that's taken us that long to do that. I know that doesn't sound like a high number. That's good. For most people. Well, the, that's amazing. It is, the, it, is by, it is the most. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, listening to philosophy lectures and things like that. But you guys, just your little symposium and the, your, each of your ability to penetrate the liter the, the written uh, philosophy is just so breathtaking to me. T talk to people about who the other guys are. Uh, so Wes Alwyn and Seth Paskin are folks that I went to uh, University of Texas undergrad or uh, uh, graduate school philosophy with. We were all dropouts. And so this was our uh, way since we're not in that field anymore. Although I guess it is, I don't know, for me, it is the majority, podcasting is the majority of my job now, but Interesting. I, I still officially have a day job. And and, uh, Wes, that, uh, and Wes is in mental health. He's sort of a psychoanalyst mm -hmm. slash a mental health professional. And then who's the other one that was one of the first up? So Seth Sal? was, Seth? Uh, is a, and Seth is, is a, a physicist, right? IT. Seth is IT. No, that's a, yes. Yeah, Seth is a, a, does actually like product management for a, I don't know, some kind of computer related company now. I don't know. He switched a couple of times, but yes, Dylan Casey who's my brother-in-law joined us a couple years in and he is a, uh, well, he's a PhD physicist, but he, right. He works for, uh, like a radiation, uh, therapy tool production. He sort of, he sort of, company. he sort of talks like a particle physicist. Was that his training? He, yes. Yeah. Yes. And he still does. Yes. I think he's officially a, some sort of physicist <laughs> in applied <laughs> yeah. applied physics. Yes. Useful physics. Well, listen, I, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we can promote your podcast. Uh, it is literally, if you want to get an exposure to the basics of philosophy, the first like 50 episodes are out of this world. And if you want to get deep in it and keep going, just keep going. Just keep going with these guys, and you'll, you'll get all the way there. What's the live one going to be about? Uh, we're still working out that uh, particular detail that we are debating that as very recently. Uh, perhaps an early Nietzsche work. Where is it going to be? We have it will just be online. Uh, online, like a, our, like a Zoom you, thing. You'd think that we would have figured out how to do this during the pandemic, but uh, no. <laughs> give, give me, give me a hint. Which Nietzsche work you? Three hundred. Is it once a week? It, so. uh, no, it's every. Well, it's now every two weeks. We oh. it every, we sort of cut it up. So we have a release every week. Wow. And so you've been working hard. No, these guys read the entire, most of the time, the entire primary literature and then penetrate it. That, that's what, I'm not, I'm not that kind of reader. I can't do it. And so I, I go to you guys and then I go back to the, to the, uh, pr the, the printed word to see what, you know, to kind of get a little more insight or to re rework things or rethink things. Um, I mean, Hegel and Kant were completely impenetrable to me before I listened to you guys. Completely. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad we could help. Uh, let me let me promote one other thing that you probably were not aware of, because only only less than a year ago, I started uh, a podcast even more aimed at beginners mm. called Philosophy versus Improv, where I am teamed up with an improv teacher, Bill Arnett from the Chicago Improv Studio. And so he teaches me an improv thing. I teach him a philosophy thing. We started to bring on guests, including some professors and, and right. people in the improv world and, uh, you know, do some little scenes inspired by the philosophy. So it is very like, you know, I'll pick one very modest topic. What is ontology or something? And just make that the the lesson. So that is if people are, are scared off by the partial exam in life, this is even easier. And then your book for kids. Yes, Philosophy for Teens, which is something I was commissioned to do. This is more, more a coincidence, but it, it did really focus my uh, having to come up with a, a, you know, a two sentence. Actually, I did have some Hegel in there and I removed it because there was no way to summarize Hegel. Any any point about Hegel in two sentences. That's right. more my uh, speed. <laughs> right. I heard somebody I, I heard I heard somebody do it with a metaphor and they said uh, essentially the owl of Minerva spreads its wings with the setting of dusk. <laughs> That's that explains Hegel. <laughs> That's the best they can do. <laughs> I need sure. a teen book. That would be me. <laughs> yeah, you would like it. It's very good. It's very good. Mark That's my level of philosophy. Yes. That's very Thank good. you to, to Drew for, yeah. for do, being one of my official endorsers. You bet. As Amazon requires on that book. You bet. All right, Mark. Well, thank you for coming All up right. and saying hi, and uh, good luck with that. I'll look for that live. Uh, Nietzsche is always one of my favorites, so I'll look for uh, look for that live live uh, program. Thank you much. All right. And, uh, Bye. Partially examined life, everybody. Go check it out. Ta-ta. Um, Ta-ta, yes. And then uh, let me bring uh, Josh up quickly. He's got his hand up there. Somebody's, oh, there was like a Sasha that had her night name up uh, here, and she disappeared. Hey, uh, Dr. Drew. Hey, Josh, what's up? Uh, not much. It was interesting to hear Mark. I'm a subscriber of their podcast. Oh, I good. really like their podcast. Good. I thought you would like um, it. And, th and they've been going towards sort of Indian philosophy. I know Mark, I... You know they they're moving towards like they're what trying I to get everything to be the truth. You know they're, they they're, they're trying to get towards everything. meditation. Mm -hmm. They're kind of you know they're incorporating the Eastern too. <laughs> yep. So just you know yep. um, it's not just the Western philosophy. But um, I guess that could be my question because you know you're mm. talking about concierge medicine, mm. and um, you know most of this is medicine, actual pills and, and shots and all this stuff. But I feel like the East, the ancient East, if we could go there for just a moment says meditation is actually really good for, to let the body sort of heal itself yes and good for the mind and to spend some time doing absolutely nothing yeah. and all of this sort of um the stoic sort of way of of health in a way in, yeah. in a sense it sort of is stoic no i get um, it and i just want your thoughts of, I, of that I, are nowadays or i i am i am going to get you some guests that will sort of get into that zone i i promise it may not be eastern for per se it may not be philosophical per se but it's going to have a little more of a clinical bent, but I, I'm I'm going to go that direction. So I thank you for for pushing us there. So, and then Susan, we have to do this Good Morning America thing right now. They were supposed to four fifteen. Four fifteen. So we got to kind of wrap this up. Caleb, I didn't warn. Did we warn you about this? No, it's okay. Uh, no, we, it's all right. No, yes. GMA yes. wants Drew yeah, back. Yeah, I got to go comment about something. So I got to kind of wrap stuff up. Sorry, Josh, for cutting you short. I do have to kind of get to it here. He's got to go put on his suit. Got to get on a coat and tie and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, thank you, Michelle, for booking. Thank you, Caleb and Susan, for producing this. Thank you, those of you on Restream and also out there on Twitter Spaces. We appreciate the questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, Steve Boswell again saying, fa uh, saying uh, fast. No, what does he say? Uh, meditation reduces cortisol levels. Yes, it does. Maybe. Yes, it does. It's reducing stress. Well, how could that be bad? Um, it, it's a, it's a complicated space. Uh, mindfulness and and um, it, you know it has a philosophical component to it, and then it has a therapeutic or clinical component to it. And so it's an interesting space. Yeah, we had to get um, my friend in here. Um, I'm blanking his name, but he's a but he's a mindfulness expert, and he could really talk about this stuff in a more meaningful way. So again, I got to run here. We thank you all for being here. Thank you, those of you over on Rumble. Let me take one look over there. We'll to see. see you on Tuesday. How are they doing? Rumble, Rumble up. Wait, wait, I can't hear you. Mackie was cracking me up over there. And okay, well, it's Jeff a lot going on. Back and it's a lot going on. I know, I know. Uh, let's they, see. They were all chit-chatting. They are we, indeed. We like our Rumble rants. We, we appreciate you guys showing up. Let's get Duncan. Um, we appreciate again. our Facebook rants and Duncan's our. On, where's Duncan? 
No, he's not. I said, let's get him on a show again to talk about philosophy and everything. Okay. I know. All right. You have to call him, though, Drew, because he's. Yeah, Duncan is very good with Eastern philosophy. That's a good idea. All right. So I'll see if we can get Duncan in here, too. We got. And and by the way, if you have. We love our YouTubers and our Twitchers. um, If you have suggestions, uh, contact at drdrew.com is a place to send them. Tweeters and our. Contact at drdrew.com. We will. will, Susan sees everything and she will. (laughs) She will. uh, I see all. Take them seriously. I am the voice of God. So thank you all for being here. Uh, We're back on Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Okay, that we good for four o'clock still yes the baby said it's okay Caleb? Baby love said my it's number okay, one but... uh rumble fan jep jehip 767 jehip jehip <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like um, yep the, it's the, no it's the, yep sounds like the ghost <laughs> episode from what we do in the shadows uh, yep absom like, jahan yes. jahan yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absom Jahan, where you have to see if you have not seen what we do in the shadows, I cannot recommend it strong yep. enough. But particularly the ghost <laughs> episode will drag you in so fast you will not be able to get over it. Like me, I'm obsessed. But uh, one of the one of the vampires. It's about vampires, and I could give a shit about vampires. But this is so funny and so brilliantly written that it's it's brilliant. And one of the vampires, um, ghosts, uh, comes in with unfinished business. He's trying to find his horse. Jahan. Uh, Absam, Jah- His name's Jah- John. Jahan. But he calls him Jahan. Jahan. So. Oh, it's uh, such a cute episode. Yes, a good one. But right, anyway, Jahep, you're, yes. uh, you're, he's, our, he's our moderator over on Rumble, and yeah. he will be the rudest one there for y'all. All so. right, good. And we will Just see like you. we have over on Twitch with Tom. Tom's there. Uh, Tom is our. Swatting the trolls. Yeah. Or out trolling the trolls. Or out trolling the However trolls. You look at yeah. It. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for being here. We'll see you on Tuesday at four o'clock. See you then. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. So are you saying that like she should do more therapy and, and maybe do a little less <laughs> less like, porn more therapy? Yeah. Less porn. <laughs> I'm saying but much like the alcoholic has to stop drinking, she's gonna have to go cold jerky for a little while. And cold not, jerky. There you go. Jerky. And not uh, it's an old love line term. 